I guess it's still broken. So good evening. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm on behalf of the Pomona Student Union and Pomona College Fair Trade. I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Ethics and Labels, Considering Consumer Activism. The Pomona Student Union is a nonpartisan, student-run organization that works to increase campus dialogue about significant issues. We do so by bringing speakers together in order to represent multiple angles on various current events and debates. We do not intend to promote any single perspective, but instead encourage the campus community to challenge assumptions and consider all points of view. We hope that the conversation does not stop after tonight, but instead that you consider what was said tonight and continue the dialogue with friends, peers, and professors. If you have any questions about PSU or our future events, please visit web the website at psu.pomona.edu or find us on Facebook, of The Pomona College um, Fair Trade is a student group whose goal is to increase awareness about fair trade on campus. The group has worked to achieve fair trade college recognition for Pomona and connect students and members of the local community. I'm really excited about the panel tonight. Um, we will be speaking about product certifications. In recent years, various forms of ethical certification systems have begun to show up increasingly at our grocery stores and coffee shops. You can buy fair trade chocolate, direct trade coffee, and organic apples. Large corporations like Starbucks have begun to sell their own ethically sourced tea, coffee, and cocoa. Green Mountain Coffee, which is the coffee we drink in our dining halls, and we will probably be depending on increasingly in the coming weeks as the semester comes to an end, is certified fair trade and organic. These labels are supposed to tell consumers that they can feel confident that the product was produced with fair labor and good environmental practices. Some even argue that certification is a response to increasing neoliberal trade policies. Yet what do these labels really tell us? By purchasing certified fair trade or organic, are we as consumers reducing inequality? Or is this simply a way to use a consumer's market system to increase profit and decrease consumer guilt? Tonight we will delve into these questions and more and ask whether or not we have the responsibility as consumers, and if so, what are these responsibilities? Are these certification systems the answer? So with us tonight um, to discuss these complex questions, we have Myra Oriana, um, Mike Carey, Professor Matt Morning, and Professor Nathan Google. Myra is the owner and distributor of Petrachia Coffee. This business concentrates in specialty coffee and the farmers associated with Petrachia are encouraged to participate in training sessions that teach them about sustainable farming practices. All profits are shared with farmers. The story of her and her family's farm has been the focus of the documentary, The Way Back to RSP. Mike Perry is the founder and CEO and Rosemaster of Clash Coffee. He blends background in chemical engineering with a love for great coffee to balance science and artistry in achieving the perfect cup of coffee. Mike is committed to the direct trade model builds on quality and sustainability. The company roasts beans locally and supplies many local businesses, including the Mali Coffee House. Professor Warning teaches economic development, econometrics, and international economics at the University of Puget Sound. He has served as a consulting producer and content specialist for the documentary Buyer Be Fair, The Promise of Product Certification, and as a stakeholder commentator for the Starbucks Corporate Responsibility Reports. He has also written for O Magazine and Sustainability. Nikki Lisa Cole is a visiting assistant professor of sociology here at Pomona College. Her research focuses on global supply chains and the ethics of consumption. Her first book on the sourcing and consumption of coffee is currently under review at Haymarket Books. Her research on the marketing and consumption of ethical coffee has been published in the journal Race, Class, and Gender, and will soon be featured in an edited volume on consumerism from stage public. You can find the writing on global production, consumption, inequality, and sustainability in Producer Magazine and Imagine Magazine, and her blog, 21st Century Nomad. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Tonight's event will take the format of a panel discussion with three questions. Speakers will be allowed three minutes to respond to each question, followed by a five minute open discussion among all speakers. We will then open it up to questions. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to please silence their comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
way to work our way down the line. So here's our first question for today. Many argue that ethical consumption is a way for consumers to vote with their dollar and effectively create change. Yet others claim that this mentality is little more than a marketing technique in which a narrative is sold to the consumer as a means of increasing profits. Can ethical consumption be seen as a form of political activism, or is it simply a way to appease consumer debt? Please I would say that yes to both. Um, your, but the only problem is that according to the bill of the consumer is not sustainable. Um, with um, political activism, as a farmer, we see the future because we see the commitment on the consumer to continue to buy a product. If you're buying the product just because you're feeling guilty, you might do it once or twice, but after that, Guilt might But if you're committed to our cause, or to helping families, you will continue to buy people. And, you, and for us, that's, um, we see the future in that, in not in the guilt. Um, in the guilt, you probably, um, as a farmer, um, if I'm asking you to buy my product because you feel guilty, I don't want you. I don't want the consumer to feel sorry for us. I want the consumer to support our families to continue to make a decent living. With the guilt, if you, you're not supporting us, you're only buying it once or twice, but the guilt will go away. So for us, it's, uh, political activism is uh, sustainable, is what can take us out of the misery that many small farmers in, in our countries with live in. So that's uh, personally my opinion about uh, political and, and guilt. Uh, I'd say conscious consumption is extremely important. Uh, if, if you are supporting the products and practices that you believe in, then you can influence uh, business and it could We've seen that happen. Things like uh, you're probably too young to know much about dolphin safe tuna, but uh, you probably only see dolphin safe tuna these days. Uh, organic food. Uh, I just went through the experience. I, I was off down for years because I didn't want to buy because they used to pluck down off living birds, and apparently they got the message, and now nobody plucks down off living birds. So I was happy to to uh, buy a down comforter last week. <laughs> so th these things matter, uh, and I think they matter a lot, but the change is rarely, rarely achieved without the social movements that go along with them. So around fair trade, it hasn't been, which is kind of the issue that I've been most associated with, it hasn't been that it has come just from people buying fair trade products, but from the social movement that has raised people's consciousness. And in addition, the, the kind of the buying the fair trade product then raises people's consciousness about the issue around it. Um, on the other question, um, it, it's kind of an interesting one is that are these two things of marketing fair trade for um, marketing purposes for improving your sales, increasing your profits, whatever it be, might be, and doing it uh, because you are uh, a mission-driven company, as they're called in the business, that are really uh, out to um, make fundamental changes uh, in the way these practices are, are, are undertaken. Uh, those those don't have to be at odds with one another, and not all country, all, not all companies need to be mission-driven for it to be effective. Uh, so it. If a, com if a company believes in the mission of this, that's great. If they don't, it might not be that as long as they're doing the right thing. But we have seen instances of abuse where some companies have just uh, raised the price of the fair trade products really high because they thought people would buy them. They've increased their profit margins from the fair trade. So, they, so the abuse is, pop is possible.
described it, that response, more so to marketing techniques than, say, anything else. Um, but I think it, it's important to understand that there are a variety of ways of practicing ethical consumption. Um, there, and some of them tend to be more radical or politically motivated or engaged more so than others. Um, so we can think about, say, things like downshifting or choosing intentionally to consume less or living simply um, as far as <laughs> that, uh, that are maybe challenging the consumer system as opposed to looking within it for solutions. Um, I would see, I would see, choosing certified products like organic or fair trade, or cause-related marketing products like Tom's shoes when they give a pair of shoes to somebody to buy it, or the Red campaign that contributes money to AIDS research as less politically engaged because they are they are they are in effect voting for the system of consumerism more so than they are thinking critically about the problems that are embedded in this system that gives us privileges as consumers and that works to you know, jeopardize the livelihoods of farmers and Myra and her family. Um, so I think it is, it, it can be both, but it depends on what sort of form you're talking about. Um, and I have found in my research, as have others with consumers who identify as ethically oriented folks that, um, you know, making these kinds of purchases that tell you you're making the right choice, you're doing something good for the world, can in fact dampen critical consciousness. You know, we have, I right, think we're pretty aware these days of environmental problems, problems with labor, human rights abuses, global wealth inequality, and we want to do something about it, which is great. And for us, as Americans, often that thing we can do is reach for a product that, you know, tells us that the outcome is going to be slightly better than we have gone with that mainstream product. Um, but ultimately, what we're doing now, what we're really voting for, is the system of global capitalism and consumerism that's currently in place. Um, so how politically engaged is it, I think, to buy something when we're talking about problems that are embedded in the system that we need to think more critically about, um, rather than just reach for the quote unquote product on the shelf. So I am both have a coffee roaster. I go out and I source and I find the coffee, but then I've got to come back and roast it and sell it. So I deal with Myra, I deal with farmers on that end, but then I've got to come back and, and work with consumers to be able to sell the product. So my, my view is going to come from from that. Uh, and this first question has about 17 questions in here. <laughs> so I, I hit a few of them and kind of highlight them. One, as far as consumers, I think consumers always vote with their dollars. Whatever you purchase, you make a decision to spend that. Uh, that's, that's part of a free market. That's a choice you have. It's, it's been that way as long as we can remember. People buy and choose where they want to. Uh, as far as uh, ethical consumption, I think ethical consumption is part of that free market. It's that choice people have to be able to do things. And it's something that allows for social uh, progress and change when it's done properly. But when people make a decision to buy stuff, as you talked about, you know, a dolphin free tuner, things like that, it does make a change and things can happen. So there's a difference you can make there. But I don't believe ethical construct, uh, consumption is a marketing technique. At least it's not for us. Yeah, you'll see the labels and things have to happen. Uh, what that is is you have to be told the information of something is, is fair trade, or if it's direct trade, if it's from a farmer, what's happening with it. You need that information so you can make a decision. So that's not a technique or a trick. That's hopefully information. The problem is, as you're walking down the store and you, you see a label, that's sometimes all you're seeing. You're not getting enough information. So sometimes people will buy out of guilt. They'll feel bad. And I agree with my, that's not a sustainable model. That's a short-term purchase. People feel bad and do it once. Next time they don't go down that aisle. You know, if the guy's outside on one door asking for money, people go to the other door because they don't, they don't want to feel the guilt. They avoid it. They give money the first time. And it's kind of that way, I think, with, with people purchasing out of guilt. That's not what's going to work. What's going to work is information and quality. You've got to be able, people got to be more informed. So as consumers, you need to ask questions about that. You need to learn about that. But you need to support those farmers and those products that have quality. I think that's the only sustainable model that you can have there. Uh, crop from certifications it talks about, I can tell you, I buy certified coffee, I, I buy other coffee. Uh, many coffees I pay way more for that aren't certified. And either way, I don't make more money because a coffee is certified. I don't charge more for it. And sometimes by paying more for a, for a coffee, my percentage that I make on profit is actually less. They will figure our, our overhead is fixed and other things are, are fixed. So we don't really make all that much. Uh, it can be a niche. 
and people can use it, and it might be their mission type thing. And that's what they do. But that doesn't mean they're trying to trick people to do it. I don't think we're seeing that. There might be examples you come up, but overall, I think most of us in the coffee business, we're trying to support those farmers that we believe in. Uh, political activism real fast. I don't consider you making a choice of what you've been able to purchase necessarily being political activism. It's more of a passive activism. In other words, it's kind of, it's kind of like voting. You know, we live in a democracy. People get a chance to be able to, uh, to decide what to do. There's political activists out there, and the rest of us like to vote. When you spend your dollars, you're voting. So it's kind of a passive spending. It's a passive thing you choose to do. Uh, you can go to the next level, and you can you can become an activist with that. But I think with most people, most consumers, it's more of a passive type thing. Sorry to cut you off, um, Mike, but we're going to uh, open it up for discussion for all the panelists. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free to take away. I could support what Nikki said too. I mean, uh, the example that I think of is um, how local grass fed beef is all in, and it turns out the carbon footprint of grass fed beef is actually higher than feedlot beef, too. But the, and so people make these, these switches to what is the kind of uh, the new consumer kind of choices. When the issue with eating beef is eating beef, you know that it's that it's, uh, and, and I'm not going to say everybody should be vegetarian or whatever it's going to be, but that we we buy into consumer culture and we just get more refined consumerism without questioning that consumerism. I thought that was really interesting and valuable. Yeah, to sort of expand on that, um, something I want to point out is that there's a difference between consumer culture and consumption, such as fair trade, were developed with the needs and rights of the small producer in mind. These active certification systems intended to tell consumers that the product was produced under specific conditions. To this end, are these certification systems an effective model to mediate the negative effects of the capitalist system on small producers? If so, how and why? If not, can they be adapted to work for the small producer? And so on this question, we'll have Professor Morning start. Um, where to start? I mean, the, oh, my time's going okay. Uh, the, uh, I've been working in, in rural communities in developing countries. I just was thinking about the way down for almost 30 years now. 
And uh, there's a, there's, I think there's kind of an unspoken premise to this question that small farm, and I've always, I've always worked with small farmers, but I think that there's the, the assumption that it appears a little bit is that small farm is necessarily good, is necessarily just, is necessarily environmentally sustainable. And small farmers can be as exploitative and as environmentally disruptive as large farmers. Uh, that being said, the, um, uh, the, the, if we're concerned with, with helping small farmers, and a lot of the stuff that's been done in fair trade is trying to, to write power imbalances, historical power imbalances that have been existed between small farms and, and, uh, and farm workers and that relative to the people that have the large farms, the caciques as they call them in Latin America, these, these people, um, it can be important if that is a stated goal and if consumers are going to respond to that. That's what a lot of that comes down to. I pushed a little bit, or I floated the idea several times with fair trade people that there should be a small farmer designation, that, that there would be a label that says this is from a small farm, and then people can decide if they want to support the small farms, and of course then there needs to be a social movement to do that. Uh, you know, mitigating the, 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 the negative effects of the capitalist system, I don't know, you know, I don't think, I don't think labeling is going to do that by itself. Policies and a lot of other things are going to be what's really important. But um, you know, to a certain extent, there is there is some, some positive um, uh, mitigation. I don't know how I want to put it. I mean, sometimes they benefit from the capitalist system as well. So uh, so it's hard to to frame that. Um, so I think that.
with, a, with an eye on business more so than other things, you know, that might cause environmental implications for those communities that are harmful. Um, and I'll quote uh, Martin Lopez, who works with Fund Depot, uh, another coffee cooperative, who says, the fact that we have decided to focus on the social, the environment, and the economic has been very advantageous for us. We've been changing our traditional techniques to improve the quality, um, but there have been many disadvantages as well, in particular the recent changes within the fair trade system. And he said that's why we have seen the importance of the organizations, the small producer organizations, and the networks. If there is something that we can really rescue and hold on to in fair trade, aside from the better prices, it's the organization for small producers. Sorry to cut you off, Professor okay. Cole. We're going to move on. Go back to the original part of the question there, which says that uh, you know, the fair trade in different systems keep the small producer in mind and coming up with things to be able to tell consumers. Again, I think that's good. You have to be able to know as a consumer what there is. But from the producer's standpoint, the ones I deal with, the ones I talk to, I don't think they consider the capitalist system as, as a negative on them. As a question kind of kind of molds it there. You know, to, to them, they take advantage of the capitalist system. That their problem that, that they, they face as small producers is to be able to get access to buyers, to be able to sell their product, to be able to, to get out there sometimes. Uh, fair trade helps out quite a bit there, I think, for, some, for many of the small producers. It gives them access to uh, economies of scale, access to be able to sell their product. Equipment, technology, information, uh, it kind of can empower them to help them out. But the problem is not all farmers are part of fair trade. There's also a lot of farmers that aren't, and how do they get help and access? And I think that's where direct trade can complement fair trade. We can come in and be able to work direct with the farmers and be able to help them improve. Uh, the most sustainable model and way for them, again, goes back to quality. You can go to a place or, or, or get products that are ethical, but if they're not good, you're not going to buy them again. So they've got to have a product they can sell, and that's where quality comes in. So we try to help the farmers with quality whether it be a, a co-op that's fair trade and trying to educate and be able to get it, or whether it be myself working with, with a farmer that I buy from. Uh, a friend of mine in Panama, we were there. He's got a great farm, gonna sell all his coffee. He actually was educated in the States, travels around, helping farmers in other countries. And he was in Ethiopia and saw the poor there and thought he wanted to be able to do something to help him out. He came home, he was wondering what to do, and he, he saw the workers on, on his own farm and kind of realized they were struggling and he needed help at home. So he actually set up, together with the Peace Corps, a coffee school. Because the, the pickers actually lived in an area that had great coffee. But the problem was they didn't know how to grow it. And the stuff they grew was just awful. So he started educating and teaching them and giving them access to be able to sell it. And we were there. We were introduced to their coffee, introduced to the people. We taught them to taste their coffee for the first time and to tell them what we were looking for and what we wanted. And through that, was able to build relationships with them and be able to bring in some of their coffee, some that was good enough. And those that weren't, we helped educate them on what to do. The main farmers we buy with, that's what we try to do is educate them on being able to produce a, a, a better quality product. And I think long term that's going to be more sustainable for them. Because that's what they want, is they want to be able to, to have a successful farm, they want to be able to support their family, they want to be able to sell their coffee at a, at a, a profit where they can be able to be there year after year. Maybe Myra can, can talk more to that as a producer and as a farmer. In our case, um, certifications are great.
for them to expose them to other, the other coffees that we have. And so by establishing that relationship with coffee roasters and um, me facilitating the great advantage our group has is that I'm, I'm living in the US. And so I go there during harvesting time and then my mom and my dad are working with the farmers. So I have that great contact and relationship with the farmers and I know all of them. And so um, I know what they need to be doing and I do a lot of trainings because one of the big um, issues we're having right now is the climate change is affecting us greatly and, and we have to be ahead of it. We have to find a way to deal with it because if not, um, there's no way to make a difference. And our families are relying on one harvest a year, five to six months of the year of work. Rest of the time, we don't have it. We don't have any kind of money. So to end up with the question about certification, certification works for you if you're organized and you have the money. But most farmers in our countries don't have it. And so and that's where we have relationships with grocers and, and other people in the US is pretty appreciated for us because we don't have means to pay for this. Thank you. So I think we'll open up now for a discussion from all panelists. I'll go kind of follow on what, what Myra said. I, I deal in Colombia with a, a small group of producers, much like what you have in Honduras. And, and most of these guys will have a half hectare, a hectare, two hectares, very small farms. Some produce two bags of coffee, much like your own individual <laughs> farm. And, and they don't have much coffee. And, and, it, and it used to be in Colombia, probably remember Juan Valdez and uh, you still see him now and then and big at Disneyland and kind of helped promote Colombian coffee and it's a Colombian coffee federation they would buy all the coffee from the farmers and we all get blended together so when we get coffee many times because I've been in a long time it would be a blend of all these different coffees <coughs> kind of together so it would kind of bring down some of the, the coffee wouldn't be as good as, as others so a friend of mine set up a program down there and kind of started out where he told the farmer he said we'll pay you more than the Colombian coffee federation will that will pay you double what they do. But it has to have a certain cup quality, a certain score. It has to be a certain quality. And they spent a lot of time and work tasting the coffee and, and, and pre-approving it. And then they sent it to a handful of us in the US that agreed to buy it. And we would taste it. And those that met our quality, we would buy it. And what we would do is we would take all the coffees that got a certain score that were good enough and blend them together to have our own blend of Colombian coffee. And we still do that today. But some of the ones that were really special, we'd actually pay the farmer three times of what the Federation would because we would sell that itself as an individual farmer to be able to help them out and support them. They'd be able to use that money to, to build uh, drying beds and covers and be able to, there's a lot of rain there as there is in Honduras when I was there, kind of crazy, and you know, be able to help them out. And, and it really made a difference in their lives getting this money. But it was all based, it was a model based on quality. And the company we work with down there is called Veramax. And I actually talked to him before coming here to kind of get his input from the, the small producers. And regarding the capitalist system, he, he's replied, the capitalist system on small producers is not inherently negative. What small producers need is information and access to market. With access, then their product can be judged on quality. Fortunately, with the information age, and now with the cell your phone age, and it's kind of crazy because every farmer down there can be very poor, has a cell phone. Uh, Information is more easily available to all, and any certification model not based on quality, they feel is not a long-term effective solution. So that's what I'm hearing from them. And I imagine you share some of them. Almost every. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think it's um, in our case, we have a lot of people that really um, great and amazing experience this year because we only been in business three years, and so first year I brought in. Uh, 500 pounds of coffee in a day, and it was expensive that I had to do it. The second time, we brought in 54 sacks of coffee. And last year, we went to 85. And we can only do so much because everything is done in backyard and homes. And so we're sacrificing the backyard, but it's also generating many jobs where uh, the people picking the coffee, cleaning the coffee, and the before it gets shipped to the US. They make a living because then everything is done by hand because we don't have the equipment, which in a way I'm also paid for that too because it's 
giving people a job. And so in, in most over um, laboring in uh, at least in the area where I work on, I work, I come from, are single women. And so they don't have the husbands supporting them. And working with coffee is, is, is a great benefit to them. So we're, this year was great for us. And we didn't need the certification. We didn't need a label. We didn't need anything because we had a great relationship with the buyer, with the importer, royal coffee, with other um, buyers, um, Roscoe, and also Ruba. Uh, and so just having them in that, then they pay what I ask. And for me, it's, um, it's the best thing that can happen to us because then I'm able to get this money and they were sharing all the profits with the farmers. And they didn't know how that we were sharing profits with them and many of them were able to build a patio for next harvest. Many of them, one of them bought a computer, but now he's in Facebook and he's communicating so he has a direct relationship with his buyers. So some things are, are happening and it's, it's a very, it's, it's happening in small steps but it is happening. Well, we only have a, a few, left on this question, but I did want to offer the opportunity to Professor Cole this morning to say a few conclusions. I've heard that you have one of you guys were talking about. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that was a great point. Um, and I'm sure that
Um, I, I do think that they are steps in a good direction, right? I mean, in interviews I've done with consumers who identify as ethical, I see a lot of real commitment to wanting to not be a problem causer, but a problem solver, right, in their, in their role um, as global citizens. But, um, but you know, a change within a system that is so complex as global capitalism needs to take a variety of forms and be carried out in a variety of venues and not just through our consumer purchases. Um, I think that, you know, we, we really are at a critical point in terms of survival of the planet, of the species, and, you know, what's happening with global climate change is so connected to our consumer culture to the norms of global capitalist production. Um, and that if, if we really do want to continue, we have to make significant change. I think what that comes down to, as you know, privileged consumers in the developed world, in the first world, or whatever you want to call it, is we have to make sacrifices. You know, I, it's, I don't think it's fair for us to take for granted that we should have so many things available to us at any time of the year, you know, anything we want, really, um, in, in a way that it's a right or a form of freedom that we have that available to us. I think what it is is a privilege, and it's an unearned privilege. Um, there's a long legacy of factory resources and exploitation behind these privileges that we enjoy a little bit. Um, so I'd say, yeah, labels are a great step in sort of thinking critically about what's happening with our consumption. But consumerism, as I pointed out before, I think is, is really the problem in that it's a dangerous way of life for us. Um, and we have to be willing to give up some of those privileges if we truly want to see things change. Um, and I think, you know, I see, I see ethical consumption really as a symptom of global capitalism and that it's our sort of response to these problems that we see, the environmental problems, the human rights abuses, the wealth inequality that we see um, in, in this period in which we live. And so we, we've created this, this new way of being that allows us to respond in a way in our everyday lives that, you know, makes us feel better about this position of privilege that we're in or about these crises that we face in the world. Um, but unless we, you know, work with other methods of change as well, then, you know, ethical consumption is little more than, like, a cultural, an adaptation to the cultural logic of capitalism. It's a way of justifying the system as it is, um, in the sense that it's a response to a crisis of legitimacy within the system. So I think, I think we really have to take responsibility um, as privileged consumers to, you know, step back our level of consumption and, you know, reduce the amount of privileges Uh, well, kind of like I said, I, I think ethical consumption is really tied to, to capitalism together. So I don't, I think they have to work together. And labels themselves are just really a, a bridge, a short-term solution to really get a discussion, a discussion going. It goes back to said information, to be able to get people to ask questions about that. <laughs> uh, to me, the, the solution is access, information, transparency. But it needs to be built on quality. And that's what, what we try to help the farmers as well. Uh, another farmer I work with in Costa Rica, kind of a, an exporter there. Exporters obviously make their money by, by selling coffee for farmers. He's really taken on kind of the micro mill, the small farmers, and, and trying to help them out. But he's transparent in everything. Everything that sells, the farmer knows the price. They know what he's getting. You know, he's not trying to, to take advantage of it. He's trying to help them because the more he can sell it for, he can make something they can. And I asked him about this, and he said that, I'll read here. Until more and more efficient, transparent, direct practices toward the production producers is based on cost of, trans, of production or transparency, they won't be able to succeed. And the guy in Columbia said, there ethical consumption and change with access to information that these farmers have cell phones, some of them even on Twitter, as you mentioned the one on Facebook, they can be on with their phones. Their success is tied to market access to be able to reach consumers. When we go down here, we show them a bag of coffee and it's got their name on it. They're ecstatic that they're able to be to be able to reach and be able to do that. It just gives them such such pride and joy to be able to reach consumers and, and know that their name is out there and to be able to support themselves and get a fair thing for it. But we try to be transparent with them. When we write a contract, it says how much is, is farm gate mean to the farmer? What's the end country transportation? What's the shipping to us? What each person is making along along the way. So everybody's happy and knows. But that's just one step as far as overcoming Poverty. I don't know what the solution is. When you've got a farmer, you're producing 200 bags of your own farm. In Ethiopia, you've got all these small farmers that are so small that they're trying to get out of farming. 
Because even though it'll sell for a high price and, and they're, they're part of co-ops to be able to help for economy of scale, there's not enough there to sell to make money. I mean, the coffee market's at $1.50, fair trade's $1.40, I think. It's organic, it's 20 cents higher. Uh, they, even selling for double that to the farmer, 200 pounds at $3 a pound to the farmer, is not enough money to live for a year. So uh, we can help, we can do a lot of things, but ultimately part of the problem is, is internally within the country. So I'm not sure a solution to that maybe. They <laughs> It's a serious problem, I think, as you said, it's an internal uh, problem in our countries. And I will go back to that. But uh, my personal opinion is that labor uh, are not the answer for uh, inequality and poverty. Labels benefit the labor people. They make the money because someone's paying them to make the labels. Uh, in, our, in our case, um, what has worked for us is that our Consumers are educated on the product that they are paying, they are buying. And at the same time, the farmers are also educated on the customers that are buying the product. There is a direct connection between that person making a cup of coffee and the person selling them the coffee. And that's creating high expectations, at least in our group. And I I want I am I'm only working with 16 farmers, and all of us are, I'm, I'm in producing 200 pounds of coffee. So imagine the rest of us. Um, the, the bigger producer in our group produces maybe 7,000 7, pounds of coffee. Um, and so we're all small, and what we've done is concentrating in, um, one is um, increasing the quality of <coughs> Uh, family and two is the you know, in order for them to increase and to get out of poverty, we have to have a good product, and so we have to offer the best. And we have to work hard for in order to produce the best coffee in the area, and, and that's for them is more work. But at the end of the day, we're we're seeing the results. We're getting more money for our coffee, and it's, it's it's a great benefit for each farmer, each family but also for the community. Um, another um, aspect that we're concentrating in um, with the farmers is let's not create dependency on coffee as the main <coughs> source of income for our families. Let's diversify. Okay, those months when you were not uh, planting coffee, they are might be planting beans because they do have, we have the best land in the region. And so we're, we can diversify our production Climate change is happening, and so we have to make changes, because if not, we're going to be developing, we're going to be dependent on international aid. And one of the biggest problems, in, at least in my country, is being that we're being dependent on financial aid from countries such as the U.S. We appreciate the help, but it, um, it's, very, I mean, it's more appreciated when you teach us to work and they pay high price for our product. We, we have to work hard as farmers and as farmers. We can't depend always on, on, on the aid or the guilt. Thank you very much. Uh, I get to be the downer guy again, I guess. Um, <laughs> and I, I feel kind of funny being the economist doing the meta analysis on this, but we got to this question. I mean, I do question the question a little bit because the positionality issue is a uh, little ironic. I think it's some uh, earnest attacks on inequality and capitalism at a $55,000 a year school. <laughs> My school is much cheaper, only costs $50,000 a year. It's much more reasonable and they're proletarian development. Uh, at Berkeley, we call this the Neiman Marxist discussion. Uh, uh, so it's all, it's all about my pay grade, anyhow. So I don't, I don't know about capitalism, but I don't think this stuff is that is. I don't think even fair trade done by the the most fair of the organizations uh, like uh, Equal Exchange, which is an incredible company, doing and and in the work that we did for the documentary. Talking to the farmers, the, uh, they said the only people that treat us like real partners is Equal Exchange. <laughs> Equal Exchange is the workers run cooperative in the United States. Outside of their own sphere, it's still just like capitalism. The 
way this is sold, the way it's marketed, and everything like that. It's a good product, you know, and they're doing that. So I don't think this is a, a challenge to capitalism. I think the challenge to capitalism is unregulated financial markets, you know, so we've seen like that. that, that I, I think ethical consumption, and I think this might get back a little bit to what Nikki was saying too, ethical consumption is still consumption. You know, and, and we, aren't, um, we aren't overturning these models, um, I, I don't think. And, and I'm, you know, I think I'm more of a mainstream, per, mainstream person than some of the paradigmatic shift people that are in this as well. So that's reflecting my own, uh, my own kind of perspective. Great, so I'll have a few minutes to discuss this final question, um, and then after that, we'll open it up to the audience and start thinking about your questions for the speakers. And uh, go ahead, speakers. Well, sort of getting back to the issue of governance that I brought up and some other people touched on earlier, you know, this notion of whether or not um, consumption can change or ethical consumption can change the world, um, I think, you know, our, our burden as privileged folks is not to fix the world. I think it's to listen to the people who are experiencing the brunt of the problems um, that are endemic to the system. So like Myra was pointing out, you know, their family farm is having to adjust their harvest cycle and how they do business because it's changing because of climate change. You know, this is something that they, they have to face and deal with. Um, and you know, I think if we wanna we wanna think about big solutions to poverty, to inequality, to how we address climate change, we have to be willing and able to listen to the people who are really experiencing the worst of it and take their perspective for the truth and you know craft solutions that are going to work for them and not against them and craft solutions that don't just respond to our desires as consumers to be able to feel good about the lifestyle. I'll throw a question to you and, and Matt, and you can answer as well. But I said it. I was talking to a guy from Ethiopia yesterday, contacted you, and, and asked him some of this stuff. And, and he said that the, the youth, they're, they're trying to get away from the farms. They, they can't survive. And it's not just it's not because of price. Uh, you know, the ones that are part of the co ops and, and have strength to be able to sell, they've got some issues there that are going on. but. You know, that, that's not the issue. The issue is they don't have enough land. They can't produce enough trees. It's, it's impossible for them. You know, you'd be a big farmer there with 200 <laughs> trees. So how do they survive? What are the solutions for them? You, you've been there. You've been on. Do you have any ideas? Or? Like, one of my countries, like, people 
negative influence of fortune. But if you go in this for instance, I think you're making a big difference because you're teaching people to be self-sufficient. You're teaching them you're not depending on others to come and do those things for you. You can do that. You're empowering them. And I think that's what I remember seeing when I was growing up. I was exposed to seeing this. I was always hanging out with this for guys because they were different. They were uh, they they had a big I don't know what what what, what it is, but I think it's if you want to make a change that or expose yourself to go to another country. And and you wouldn't even believe what, what the difference it makes. At, at least for someone who has been the experience. Or maybe one last thought. Two things that, I mean, I think, I think she's being very generous about the Peace Corps, but I think it is transformational for the people that participate. It's good to hear that it's doing something because it, it seems like it is transformational in that way. Uh, and another, um, the diversification question, I guess, is something you asked about too, which I heard. They had a big comments in Guatemala. There was a coffee crisis 10 years ago, about where the prices dipped to the lowest point they'd been in 35 years. They were just devastating communities across the world. And they had a very large uh, gathering in Guatemala to try and talk about, um, about alternatives for coffee producers. The coffee producers often live in very marginalized areas, very away from good roads and all these <coughs> things. So it, it, but it turned out it was very hard to find things they could do where they could compete against people that were closer to markets and all that. So it's hard for people to diversify out of coffee. And in the middle of the crisis, what, people, what somebody said from Nicaragua said they just need to move to Manantha, you know, which is not a great, a great solution, but that was kind of where they, they came to. It was a really kind of depressing outcome. But um, yeah, so it's nice when coffee prices are good, as they were last year and the year before. Yeah, so. But well, we don't know this year. Yeah. Right now they are low, but all right, so now it'd be great um, to get the audience involved, and I'd love to hear some questions, um, either directed towards specific speakers or um, for the group in general. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so first of all, thank you guys for being here. It's great to hear from all of you. I always had a question specifically for you. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Hi. Uh, yeah, and I think the professor over here <laughs> 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 said, said that, um, said that uh, as consumers, we should step back our level of consumption. And so my question is for you, for the 16 farmers that you work with, would it help people step back their level of coffee consumption? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it, won't, it won't, um, see, this is the deal we have. We have a specialty coffee, so it's more expensive. So those uh, roasters are paying more for that coffee. That's a great thing, and I think you might, you might agree with me, is that coffee there are always people who are willing to pay $90 for a pound of coffee. Because it's good. And so that's where we're, uh, <coughs> instead of doing mass production, we're, um, we're doing micro runs, which means that uh, the coffee from Rosy Bell's farm is not mixed with the coffee from, from Maria's farm. And so that coffee is dry in the thin, separate from other. It has a uniqueness in it. And so when, um, especially the experts here, they can identify the difference in those two coffees and they will pay more for the coffee they like the best. And so that's the great advantage of this we have that we're working with microns, which is um, which is a new trend. And you will see if you go to a, a coffee shop, ask them, do you have a single origin coffee? That means that a coffee shouldn't be has, it has not been mixed with other coffees. But sometimes they have a special blend. And that's also also good because it's coffees that have the same uh, characteristics. And, and so it has an effect as if you're reducing how much coffee you're buying, buy the high end coffee. And that's how it benefits us. If you're buying the inexpensive <coughs> coffee, it's benefiting most likely uh, the big producer, but they also Jobs for a lot of people too. So keep that in mind. We don't want to be against them too because they also support our economies. And so I think it's, it's finding balance where you're making an 
informed choice. Now we can with internet, you can go online and believe me. If you type uh, a name of a farm, if it exists, it's there. And if it doesn't exist, and the roster told you that it exists, then you go back to the roster and say, what happened to the farm? Because the farm should be there. And so that's, uh, uh, we're, we're making them accountable. Everyone in each level is being accountable for what they sell. They say I have a relationship with Maria. I, I hope you have a relationship with Maria. And so if you can be lying, you have to be honest. And I think it's, it's, it's what I, I'm asking and, and hoping to develop that. If you're saying that you have a relationship with a partner, I hope that relationship is very honest relationship and you're treating them well. Because that's what you do when you have a relationship with So let's make everyone, everyone accountable. I would add to hers, I obviously know lots of other roasters. I don't know too many roasters that, that lie, most are pretty upfront. Yeah. If you ask questions, as we talked about, get information asked, you can find out who the farmer is, where the farm is, what the bridle, the bean is, all that type of stuff. And you're talking about people will pay for stuff. Real quick, they, they've got this thing on in these auctions for coffee to find the best coffee in a country. And several years ago, years ago there was a, uh, a graduate from the uh, Mona College called Price Peterson bought a farm in Panama and they were going to have their first auction to find the best coffee in their country so he had this one area of his farm he had this funny kind of tasting coffee but he thought it was really good and he did some research and found out it was this geisha varietal so he entered it in this in this competition and he got first place so then when they had the auction it said at the time a world record price of $13 a pound the next year went for uh, 26, then 52, then a year after that, a group of U.S. buyers won at 130 a pound, and we were one of those roasters. 130 a pound, we sold it for $100 for a half pound bag, sold that really quick. And it sounds like a ton of money, but at $100 for a half pound, you're probably going to get 20 cups of coffee. It's about $5 a cup for the best coffee in the world. And at dinner, you can have, by you look 21, Big crummy glass of wine for five dollars and you're getting the best coffee in the world it's really a value and i just read yesterday where starbucks actually got a geisha varietal from costa rica well that that's one they had, they had two two different ones one was that seven dollars a cup they had another one they only sold online only they had 450 bags uh, and i think they sold it at forty dollars for an eight ounce bag and they sold out in half an hour so if the quality is there, people will buy it. The quality per cup is not that expensive. And that's what you need to support is great coffee. And to respond to your point about consumption levels, I think that what these two are pointing out around quality and price makes a lot of sense and actually resonates with my point in that you only have a certain amount of money to spend, right, as a consumer. So if you're spending more on coffee than you normally would, but you're getting better quality and you're getting the assurance that that farmer is being fairly compensated for it, then I think ultimately that's better for everybody than buying. Maybe you consume less of it on a daily basis because you have to spend more money to get it than you normally would. Um, but you're not buying the stuff that is keeping people in poverty. And how much to drink? There's been a lot of studies out. I read one recently. Six cups a day reduces cancer. So that's a nice starting point. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the returns from the super high end coffees are going are have much of an anti poverty component. Just to be honest on, on that one. Uh, I, I would just what it brought to mind for me is you I don't know if you've heard about this fire in, in a Bangladesh garment factory last week that killed a hundred people. And Bangladesh has become it's the world's largest garment producer. So now we have, we find out, we knew before conditions weren't so great. Cambodia was supposed to be good. It turns out Cambodia is not that great. So do we stop buying garments from Cambodia? Is that the response that we make on this? Or is it, you know, do we take a different kind of response? Just, uh, University of Washington just dropped its affiliation with uh, Adidas, I think it was. It wasn't Nike, because Nike said it. they give them a lot of money. Uh, because the United <laughs> Students uh, against sweatshops uh, had a very successful campaign to expose some of the abuses 
Uh, I mean, I think your question is a really good one. Is, is, uh, is our best response to stop buying this, this stuff? Uh, and and it's, yeah, it's not easy to, to figure out what they have the choice to be made. And should we be buying, you know, buy more from Bangladesh, increase the, the demand for garments from Bangladesh? And then maybe there can be more transparency in the in the value chain or whatever that where they where they find out who's what the conditions are in the factories. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work or if that's just going to you know perpetuate this the way it is now. Do we have another question? Uh, yes. So um, I guess I'm curious about how these these uh, you know the certification. But I know some of you expressed skepticism about that. That you know they charge a lot of money to get you know, an organic certificate. So it's like, how does that work? You know, what is their business model? How these are these nonprofits? I buy a lot of organic coffee at the farm level. It costs the farmer a lot of money. It takes three years to get certified and inspect the farm. I think it's twice a year. Uh, once it gets certified as organic, there's paperwork that travels with that coffee every time it goes somewhere. When it comes in here, we've got to have transactional certifications of, uh, with every delivery we get. We're certified as roasted as organic. We have to put the coffee in a different place. We have to use a different procedure as far as purging before we do it. Uh, I actually have organic. I have a certification with the county health department, the National Organic Program, which is the USDA federal and now the state two years ago decided they needed to make money so now i pay the state i paid three people for one certification they all well the state just collects the money it's another 550 dollars they don't do anything the other two actually come in they inspect they make sure we're doing stuff right and, and they look at how we're doing it they also look at the paperwork trail they, they will pick a few of my coffees and they'll do an audit on that coffee how much did i buy how much did i sell where did it go they'll follow that through to make sure that we're not buying 100 pounds and selling 200. So they're, they're pretty on top of it, which, which is good. Uh, so primarily, if, you're, if, you're, if it's certified as organic, uh, I think you're pretty safe that it's certified organic. But I'll tell you, a lot of coffee that we buy is not certified organic, but it's organically grown. A lot of the farmers can't afford to be certified organic. Uh, how do you know? You go back and ask them questions. One more question. I think this will be our last question, so Sorry, take it away. Okay, well, um, fine. <laughs> do you see that certification helping the grower that chooses to certify? Or is it more, um, <coughs> you sell more because people think organic is trendy? A little bit of each. I, I mean, uh, in, in some areas, the farmer, they'll get more money because it's organic, supply and demand. But on the negative side is, as you share, you produce less when you're organic. <coughs> So it's a trade-off, it's a decision a farmer has to make if they want to go through it. I, I don't know that the farmers necessarily only do it because they're going to get more money for it. I think it's a choice they choose to make and they can afford to be able to get the certification. Whether they come out ahead or not, I'm not sure. Uh, and some people buy organic it's a choice, it's a choice they make, it's a lifestyle choice that they make and how they spend their money and that's good. Uh, us personally, I make the same amount of money on an organic pound of coffee as I do a non-organic pound might sell it for different prices as we pay a different prices. So we don't necessarily make any more. You know, if the farmer comes out ahead and the consumer though, they've got, you know, they feel good about what they're buying. I think it depends on the certification too. Uh, there's something I've heard in the field a lot was uh, there's Rainforest Alliance certification. I don't know if you've seen that one around. It's another one that's there. And, and the growers that are working from Oaxaca that is, you know, we don't give you extra money for that. It's not worth it. So just kind of simply, some of them, they, they see that they get extra money from this. From speaking at the other week, uh, they saw that they got extra money, so they didn't. Right, and I you know earlier on, and I've heard from producers as well, that there can be co co corruption with the cooperatives as well. So, um, you know, whether or not that 10 cent or 20 cent premium that the roaster pay is for the certification is getting back to the producer is not necessarily a guarantee. I like to stay away from the politics because 
because I don't, so far I don't see politics doing much for my country because it's about corruption anyways, and so I'm staying away from that, but that's what I see in Cuba. And um, they do the certification because they can afford it. You know, there's a big group of farmers, and so they, they are able to have that much capital to invest in the certification. So of course, they get more money when they sell their coffee. But the money, I don't know if it, I think it's actually ending uh, or going back to the farmers because most of the highest paying positions are for the heads of the All right, so I think that's a, that's a wrap. Um, I have a couple announcements for PSU and um, more on the topic. So if you're interested in, in kind of continuing this discussion, as we said at the beginning, um, we're lucky to have Elizabeth Bennett here um, with us, and she'll be talking tomorrow in Oldenburg at noon for the Oldenburg Lunch Series, and her she'll be talking about her research, and her presentation is titled Governing Fair Trade, um, Voting and Voice in Fair Trade Labeling. So that should be great if you're interested in learning more. And um, PSU's next event is Political Correctness at Pomona College, and that'll be Tuesday, December 4th in Con 101 at 8 p.m. Um, and now I think it'd be great if all of you would join me in really thanking our speakers. And thanks to all of you for coming out. Thank you. Uh, of course, if anyone wants to learn more about